All righty. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mike Z. This is Chris. And we are the Whatnot Podcast. Yes, we are. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'd like to pretty much going to start a series of these podcasts live uh, to, you know, just to kind of get interactive with the community. Um, but we figured today would be a good idea to actually tell you about who we are, why we're doing this in the first place, and all the whatnot that goes along with it. Yeah, and you know, you might you might know us from films like Sander, 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 Paper, or Hey, I'm Finished. But yep. tonight we want to come to to the real people, the people of the whatnot community. That's right. So all two, all uh, two of them, right? <laughs> all zero of them, baby. Hey, it's to be expected. So, uh, you actually may know us from Kling Spores Woodwork and Shop. Um, we did a lot of live series last year um, during the lockdown time. Chris and I were bouncing back and forth, and we kind of enjoyed this format. And then we wanted to do something more that was along the podcast relation, just due to the fact that we get so many questions. Um, we answer a lot of the same questions over and over. And then we started talking about it. It was like, why couldn't we just address these common questions that people probably have? They don't want to ask them. They feel embarrassed sometimes in woodworking. There's really no reason to. We wouldn't be where we're at if we didn't ask questions. So we want to help everybody. And at the same time, we figured this would just be a great platform to do so. Yeah, and we both have uh, pretty active uh, social media platforms on our on our personal side. Um, and so, you know, we thought, we already knew each other. We got along well. We both have a crazy, weird, wacko sense of humor. So we thought, well, let's just put that to use, you know, and make a million dollars off of it. Yeah. Instead, we couldn't do that. So we thought we'd make a podcast. <laughs> you know, it's always budget friendly. Yeah. Well, you well, got to start somewhere. I'm going to let you start since you're the older of the group. Age before beauty. Yeah. Well, that's just usually the way it goes. Well, kind of what we wanted to talk a little bit about the first night, just so you kind of know kind of what you're getting invested in with this group of yahoos here, is what got us into woodworking and uh, what, what kind of led us down that road that, you know, not many people go into unless it's later on in life and they're looking for a way to de-stress. For some reason, we both fell into it as young men. Um, uh, I think I got started into it in the late 80s, but I followed my grandpa around for years and um in middle school they had to actually had a class for it and i was like heck yeah i'm on for that anything to not have to do english so uh still had to do english but anyway took the shop class in middle school loved it took it in high school all four years and loved it um matter of fact uh what kind of launched me to really want it even more was my senior year uh, i was one of the first group of guys that they offered an apprenticeship to at Broyhill Furniture. Uh, what really led me to that was because they let us out of school early. I got out of school my senior year at like noon and had to be over there by like 1.30 or 2. That's classic, a good reason. classic senior skip school kind of way, you know, but it was legal. So I was like, heck yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah. But learned a lot about the, I guess, industrial furniture side of it. Um, realized real quick that wasn't where I wanted to be. I didn't like that production pace. Um, I wanted to build more of that custom one-off kind of stuff. And, you know, my girlfriend, now my wife, talked me out of joining the Marines after I graduated. So the only thing left was my second passion, which was woodworking. And uh, worked for a cabinet shop and just enjoyed that. And I did a lot of installs, did some builds, uh, did a lot of a lot of interesting things at that in that career. And it just kind of catapulted me into, uh, you know, doing it for myself on the side um, learning more about it, having my own shop and, you know, here we are, you know, three kids out of the house and married 25 plus years later. Now I'm still searching for the shop and love the smell of sawdust in the morning. There you go. Yep. You used to have a sign above your desk that was uh, sawdust is man glitter. Yeah. 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 You know, I think I changed that to just glitter. Um, yeah. Cause there's a lot more women in this hobby craft profession now than there ever was when I got started. Well, I remember there not being as many that were being promoted. Like there are now there's, there's so many. So it gives you that uh, community feeling of woodworking that it's, it doesn't matter who you are. It's wood. There's tools. 
and everyone can get a chance to do something and build something for themselves, which I think is great. Yeah. And if there's anything I learned when I was doing a ceramic tile for a while is that women tend to be a lot more detailed. So they're, they're, they're willing to take that extra time to make sure it's right. Whereas us guys is like, yeah, that's good enough. And we roll it on to the finishing stage and well, you know, you had a good example of what happens with that tonight. Oh yeah. So, um, what I find very interesting is um, just speaking of the battle of the sexes, as far as the trade goes, that I always found that in the shop setting, factory setting, anywhere where you seem to have more women in our department is because of finesse. They had such an eye for detail. They had such a finesse to to their approach. And so I definitely saw that uh, in, in all the different things that I got into as far as woodworking goes. But I think it's funny that you grew up here in North Carolina, which was the furniture capital of the world for years. So to have that apprenticeship to me, I, I grew up in, at that time, high school would have been Arizona. So there wasn't, you know, furniture factories. Um, so I just, uh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. So I think that's cool. Well, don't let the, uh, don't let the glow of that uh, deceive you. Cause most of the time on the second shift, which is a lot of what I worked, last end of the first and first part of the second uh was they had us doing all the grunt work really in prep for first shift coming back the next day so it was building pallets it might have been sorting hardware and parts mm -hmm. uh running running from the storage room to the stations filling the products but we also had a chance to do some of the catch up during the first shift they put us on the line with the first shift people to finish out part of that that cruise so we did get some experience on the line but the majority of that after the first shift left was yeah it, it, it wasn't very glamorous at all <laughs> well i think that a lot of jobs when you're starting out are gonna be that way they're not the glamorous jobs they almost have to put you through the ringer to see if you can make it through that part to keep going so well what well, well, we realized real quick was me and I think two, there was, there were a total of seven or eight guys and me and one, maybe two other constantly realized we, but we all three had, you know, abilities and, and skill sets that worked in that, that field. And so we turned it into a competition after first shift left. Got and it. then after the first shift manager left the second shift manager, he just liked to roam around and sit in his office and read books or something so anyway we we turned it into quite the competition to see who could for instance if we got put on pallets uh we made sure we both got put on pallets at the same time because it used a special uh staple gun that shot in quick succession so it was like uh, if you held the trigger down so it was quite quite cool so we, we turned it into a competition who could build the most pallets well that didn't yield too well because what, what ended up happening when we we took a what what should have taken us six hours to do we had it done in three <laughs> <laughs> and they're like well i gotta find more things for you to do now no 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 like i said the second shift manager he was never there so uh oh, even better that Fourth was a big that was, that was a big train yard or train uh, track that that ran perfectly parallel and there were a bunch of bay doors that would open so they could offload the train cars mm -hmm. or you know load the train load cars them. so we found one on the far end and uh, we'd always go open that door and just sit out there and um well, I'm a young man. I wasn't married then, so I can say it. We always whistled at the girls as they were walking past because it was a section right near the park. So my younger days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we all had them. I wasn't much of a cat caller. I didn't think I had the skills to be able to cat call anything. So I never did, never jumped in that. But I worked on plenty of crews that were doing that. So I know, I know what you're talking about. Well, I mean, you know, being more young men, there was very little cat calling and more just more ogling than anything else <laughs> i'm oh, yeah. glad my younger days are over man uh, my wife settled me down so i've got completely agree 100 percent straight and narrow now well let's talk about your let's talk about some of your projects things that you've done i've got some pictures here you've sent me so we can show them off so this is how many years ago was this now uh that was uh two three okay yeah two two years ago Two years ago. Wow. So you have moved uh, into this house and it happened to have a shop. So this is the very beginning of that. Yeah, we, we uh, for, a, for a while we moved and I didn't have a shop. So everything was in storage for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I ended up selling a few things because I, I had money. Well, 
at it was cost in storage. So my only criteria when we went to buy this house was I don't care how many bedrooms, bathrooms, I don't care what it looks like. All I care about is it's a shop and not one that you park your car in. Yeah. That was the words to my wife. And uh, you'd be surprised how many houses she still threw in the list that really didn't have a shop. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. I'm not even going to look. But yeah, so it was a, uh, it was, I took a shot before we started loading it up and uh, I had uh, my Delta contractor saw, which was the last year they made them in the U S I've had that since probably oh, four, five. Cool. And um, maybe somewhere in that ballpark, but uh, that stayed with me. Um, beyond that, I had a miter saw and a few, you know, hand tools and, and some cordless stuff, but everything else I've uh, recouped over the last three years, maybe is what that was. But so, so anyway, We'll have some, we'll have, we'll definitely have a podcast on that because I've had to do the same thing, get rid of all the tools, rebuild, get rid of all the tools and rebuild to where I'm at now. So I know that there's definitely certain tools that I had to have that I knew were going to make or break anything I could do for the future. So, and I come from a different, completely different mindset where you're doing now CNC building lots of jigs, lots of repetitive actions, lots of cutting. Um, to where I'm on the finish side. So a lot of my needs are completely different from yours, but yet they are requirements. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a fun one. Future topics. Well, and you do, you do some building, but see, I think that's why you and I go get along so well is, you know, I do a lot of the rough grunt prep work and, and you're, you're more of that, that finesse and, and mm. you've got that, set, that, that amazing finishing expertise that just, you know, can set it apart. So. I would think my wife would definitely disagree with that because, yeah, you know, uh, so there was that trick that I showed with the tape. You put it on the back of something, you pop the holes in there with the screws, you take the tape off, you stick it on the thing. Mm -hmm. The reason for that, because there was a post where it had like, I would say probably 36 holes across the wall trying to find the stud. <laughs> I was that guy because I would constantly go over there and, and knock on the wall and be like, oh, yeah. that's one. And then drill a hole. Nope, that's not a stud. And then keep going and. So when she showed me that post, I was like, that is hilarious because that'll save me everything in time. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's one thing I'll say after doing a lot of installs, I got pretty good in, in knowing how to push the sheetrock in and do the tap knock. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I got pretty good at that. So I must have lost my touch over the years. <laughs> that or I will say this house is is not like no other house, just the way it's built. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, get into your electrical fun one day, I'm sure. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Don't even do that. No, no, I'm not. That was a three hundred and fifteen dollar learning lesson, I like to call it. Where if I had just checked the plug my wife originally told me to check, I wouldn't have had to spend that money. But that is for another day. Life so let's, Yeah, I know. So let's see here. Um, so you got into CNC work this mm -hmm. past year, year and a half. Well, I, I was interested in it for a while because um, there was a stint where I worked for Clingspore Abrasives for about, I don't know, four or five years. And I headed up the department that oversaw all the woodworking product line. Well, they had a line of router bits. So I was working with a lot of commercial CNC guys and companies and learning, had to learn a lot about speeds and speeds and proper materials and the right bits. And so, you know, being with a lot of those same folks, for years, you, you kind of get an itch for it and you see some of the benefits and, you know, we'll probably have a conversation one day about whether CNC is real woodworking or not, but I can tell you that what I have found is in incorporating that into my normal woodworking has just transformed what I can do in my shop. And it, it has enabled me to do things that I normally couldn't do. Okay. Um, you know, so, I mean, for, for instance, uh, I've gotten into a couple of uh, customers now that they build guitars and well, they don't have 15 to 16 inch planers. Well, neither do I. I've got a 13 inch. Well, uh, CNC back there, I can not only flatten it, but I can flip it over and dimension it. So when I'm done, the customer walks out with a perfectly flat and dimensioned slab that he can go build his guitar. That's and cool. I do that a lot with my woodworking now, if I'm building small parts, that uh, after I glue panels up, well, I can't really run them through my planer anymore. And I, I mean, I've done the sled thing before, but I mean, I've got an automated sled back here. So, so you I kind of started to replace uh, machines and their functions in, in traditional woodworking 
yep. utilizing the CNC for its. That's cool. You know what we need to do is one time, Mister Kyle Eli has said, "Hey, Mike and Chris, we need to get him on." That guy's got some serious knowledge about Vector. There's no doubt. He really does. And actually, Cal, I got to talk to you because I brought your name up to our uh, CTE teachers. They're doing a conference in July and they wanted to get a whole gamut of different CNC um, perspectives, if you will. Yeah. Uh, everything from like Master, um, I'm trying to think of the name of that brand now, like the really big like cabinet shop, you know, $120,000 CNCs, all the way down to something they can, the students can use to show that there is a huge field available and what to expect when they're going from something smaller to something larger. And I brought up Kyle as far as just his entire program is fantastic. Yeah, I, I turned a school on to him uh, a few weeks ago that was looking very for cool. a very similar program. And they, because of the whole COVID thing, they didn't want to do anything live. They wanted to do it you know, live via, you know, the Internet. And uh, gotcha. his, his program is perfect for that. And so anyway. Yeah, I see that growing. Uh, and that's one thing. I mean, we we may run into where we have people that jump in and we know them. We'll definitely do shout outs. Um, one thing that has given us a great opportunity of community is working at Clink Sports Woodworking Shop is the fact that we're able to meet a lot of people outside of their normal realm, get to know them as people. And that's the way that I've, I've grown up is that everyone puts their pants on the same way, you know, one leg at a time. Everyone mm. does something maybe different. Hey, I hey, clip mine up and jump off the bed right into both legs. So let's because you always wear shorts. No, I wish. <laughs> that was a joke. A That's an for us because we're not allowed to wear that. shorts at work. So anyhow, uh, back to what you're doing with CNC work. So those leaves that I showed that actually became what is this called? I can never remember this. Um, that is, uh, my daughter, she teaches at a Montessori school, uh, for, and she works with toddlers. And so she had, she had asked if I could make a, a wooden leaf puzzle. And I said, well, that's a dumb question. You know, I can. So uh, she had sent me a picture of one and essentially it was just, you know, plywood with painted leaves in the same sh similar shape to what we have there. And I said, well, that's not good enough. I said, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do the leaves out of the actual wood species. And then I'll make a nice, you know, base that they can all fit on. And so I think we did um, maple, oak, um, cherry, cypress, and something else I can't remember. But um, let's go to the video. Looks like walnut. Yeah, there's a there's a walnut, there's pine, maple, oak. Um, yeah, it's got to be a cherry. Cypress and cherry. Cool. Yeah, so it uh, turned out pretty well, and uh, as a matter of fact, it uh, was a pretty big hit with some of the other teachers, and, um, you know, but that's what I like doing. I like doing that really interesting kind of unique stuff. I don't, like I said earlier, I could care less about production. That just, that does nothing for me. I like the yeah. the, the, the custom one-off pieces. I know they take longer, a little more time investment, but the, the end yield is, you know, far better. And, you know, I've done a lot of woodworking and I've worked in the industry. I started uh, originally with Clean Spores Woodworking Shop in 2001. And um, I needed a full-time job to, with insurance because after I had my third kid, I mean, we all know what that's like. So that was a good launching pad and I was able to work mm -hmm. there, still doing my woodworking on the side, still had my side business going. And um, so I learned a lot more about sandpaper when I worked there. Mm. And, and that kind of gave me a different mindset than what I had before, because, you know, before I was like a lot of others, I just went to the big box and occasionally, you know, when I, the cabinet shop I worked for used clean spore, but you know, at the time didn't know I had access to it. So I always bought the big box, but once I started there, I realized there was a night and day difference in quality of even sandpaper. It's a like whole there is other world. Yeah. yeah. And I uh, worked there for a while, managed it about, about 10 years, I think 12 years. I managed the store for a little bit, did some other things for them. But uh, I had left for a while and then moved over to Clean Sport Abrasives and um, had some fun over there. That was a little different ball game. It was a little more industrial. So I got to work more hands on with a lot of the commercial accounts. So that's kind of when I started really noticing differences and, and dialing in on how to how to work with wide belt machines. And, and stroke belts and edge belts, <coughs> excuse me, 
And so I uh, got very knowledgeable on that side of thing. Again, it was, it was selling with the router bits, the wide belts, all these industrial machines and um, ended up working for a company um, for a while called Unita that said that that's, that's all I did was I went in and worked with their technical department and went and worked in with these industrial uh, companies and did wide belt maintenance. And so I learned a lot about the machines themselves that way. And um, that was a very good learning experience. And, um, you know, but, but so I've got my hands, I've had my hands in a lot of stuff, both from just my own stuff all the way up into the more commercial industrial stuff, a lot of the machinery, a lot of the components that go into it. So um, got a full life and, yeah. but it all revolves around woodworking. It's always come back to it. What I always enjoyed is that uh, when you were, when you were at the industrial side, um, is that you traveled? Oh yeah, and used to always post these pictures of where you were at eating that night and the the actual meal that you ate. That was uh, that was actually you know before the lockdown and everything had happened. That was one of the nice features. That was really our only benefit of being away from the families is you got to try these places. Yeah, and my my thing was um, barbecue and burgers, and because you know you can get pizza anywhere, you can get you know everything else everywhere, but you know, I always looked for the spot that claimed they had the best burger in the area. And that particular shot came out of uh, Las Vegas. We were at a, working a trade show and um, it was Gordon Ramsay's burger. I mean, you know, it can't get much yeah. better. Gotta you know, try it. Yeah. I mean, I had to at least eat one of them. Um, and oh, yeah, don't get me started about that burger. I was going to say, still to this day, you talk. I might, about I might need to escape for a moment and just, you know, be alone. But that was a, that was an amazing burger. I, awesome. I, it's, it's still number one on my list as far as yeah. I'm concerned. I was say, if you've got a better there. burger, hey, I dare you to challenge and, and let me know because if I'm in your area, I'm going to come and try that burger. He's going to try that burger. Yeah. Actually, that's every time I go out, I always look for that house specialty burger something that's local to that area, you know, something that they have, um, what is it? Cincinnati puts the fries on it. You know, now everyone's doing it, but for a while there, you, when you traveled, you got to go to these places that were local to them, which yep. was not what you were used to. So it was, yeah, I mean, it was always it, fun to travel and eat. See, I've gone to like the stockyard, which is like a hundred years old in, in Oklahoma city. I've been to the Fomanti brothers up in Pittsburgh. Um, St. Louis, there's a there's a barbecue joint. I can't remember his name, uh, Bryant, 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 something, but it's a well known barbecue joint. Uh, St. Louis also has this little diner up there that makes uh, uh, BLTs that are to die for. They only have like eight booths in the whole restaurant, so there's always a line around. But the the, the person took me up there and and they put a pound of bacon on every BLT, one <laughs> one slice of lettuce one tomato and a pound of bacon. And I allow you not a pound of bacon. That sounds like an Andy Berkey approved sandwich to me. Well, it was a Chris approved for sure. <laughs> and that's why I look the way I do. <laughs> I don't know. You're way smaller than I am. Uh, uh. Yeah, but you're vertically. You yeah. Vertically vertically. Unchallenged. Yeah. Actually, that's always the joke. So, um, backstory there is that you know this is the hickory store both chris and i have managed that store as a retail store so you get those everyday customers coming in um everyone has the same questions and it's just in a different way you know everyone's got a different application that they're working on but one of the funniest things that we ever had to do together when you worked there when you came back was that um there would be something on the top shelf mm -hmm. And instead of getting the ladder out, you just be like, hey, Mike, can you go ahead and grab that real quick? Would you would you mind reaching up there and getting that for me? Yeah, there were a couple of times where I was already on the ladder getting something down and he would just come beside me. Hey, did you need this? That actually was a lot of fun because when I hear you talking and I'm helping someone else, and I just kind of scroll on by. <laughs> just go ahead and grab it for you at the top shelf. Here you go. And that was, oh, my gosh. That's for me. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, what are you, six six or something? I don't know. Yeah. I'm shrinking now that I'm getting old and fat, but six four, yeah. So, so uh, lots of fun, absolutely. And then, would you say that on on your YouTube channel that you have, Crisscross Crafts, would would this be the number one video? Uh, by far, yeah. That that's I think got like twenty 
26,000 views on it. That, uh, that was my crosscut sled. That was a culmination of all my years of woodworking and all the sleds I've ever built and all the things I liked and disliked about them. I used that micro jig system on my drill press table mm. and instantly knew that that's what I wanted integrated into my sled. And at that point, all the ideas just started spinning and whirling and, uh, that's just the sled only. I've got probably 15 or 20 jigs that I've built for that sled. I was going to say, uh, you have so many jigs, you actually don't get to see the sled. There's, there's so many things you've done with it. Yeah. I mean, a matter of fact, I just launched a video on uh, part one of just some of the, the sled jigs that I've made. And, um, man, I'll tell you, I, I very rarely will go to the miter saw anymore unless it's just to do a rough chop. Um, everything I do, it's precision on the table saw on that sled because I took the time to dial that fence in and get it very, very precise. And yeah, it's, it's been a game changer in the shop for sure. And on my channel. So it's kind of a win-win on both, both fronts. So then, uh, and just to, just to conclude where we got together really, and things started to um, become crazy for us was that back in, uh, I'm trying to think now how long it's been 2013, maybe. Oh, it's been years. It was 2012 but, when it was whenever I had come back to, and you were there. Okay. So then had to be two, around 2012, 2013, uh, there was a transition change with Kling Spore Abrasives Industrial, and we were assigned the woodworking part of the training. They wanted to just change it all up. Not quite sure if they were um, 100% on knowing who we were at the time, but we did start to find out that we had a lot of fun doing the trainings. And what we would do is that, uh, you know, when you start doing them every week, you start to just, it becomes mundane, if you will. And so we started to uh, mess around when we had the safety feature. I dressed up in all the safety gear that we had, had for sale and all that stuff. You figured out how to put a glove on your head. Still to this day, don't know how you got that off. That's kind of how, yeah, I remember that. I wish we had video back then because that was hilarious when you were like, you you literally turned and looked at me and were just like, uh, like you had that look in your eye, like this is going to hurt. Video back then, it was 2012. You're, you're talking like it was done in 1947 oh, or something. 3,000 years ago. <laughs> well, I mean, we didn't really think about popping out the cell phone and taking a right. picture then like you do now. But back, back then, it was probably still a flip phone, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, I still have my pager on me, crazy enough. No, it doesn't go back that far, but you know what I mean. Yeah. But yeah, we had, we had a blast. And uh, still to this day, some of the reps that we uh, we taught uh, still say that our our sessions were, were by far the most interactive and the most fun and the most learning experience they had yeah. during their sessions of training. So. And, and just to elaborate on what we taught, we just did the woodworking abrasives used in woodworking um, proper applications, things like that. Cause these were the factory sales reps that were going to go into shops. Some people had never seen wood shops in their life walking into these, you know, they'd done metal. Um, they had done a lot of abrasive work or trade work in other trades, but woodworking was definitely not something that they knew anything about. So we had that. So you had to, you had to teach them and you had the best approach was teaching them like they're in kindergarten and start to build from there. And I learned tons from that. But, and then you had some that were seasoned veterans that were coming in and they just decided they were going to start selling abrasives. So you had to make the class kind of balance between the two. Oh yeah. And you know, those are, you know, you talked about te te teaching people like they're in kindergarten. Those are lessons that you learn. I mean, and you know, you manage the, the store as well that people would come in pretending they were experts in the field. And after, you know, a minute of talking to them, you realize that, they watched Norm Abrams, maybe 10 episodes, and that's that's where they stood as far as their knowledge base. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We all have to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but but learning that you when someone tells you they're knowledgeable, you can't always trust what that means. So I've learned just talk to everybody in plainly and simply and, and uh, not talk down to them. Because uh, if nope. there's anything I learned, you know, people people need to be respected regardless of what level they are in any form or fashion. And so just, just talking to people plain and simple, not trying to talk over them, not trying to use big words. And most of the time I couldn't pronounce them even if I wanted to. <laughs> I so, couldn't spell them. Yeah. So just, just talking to people simple, you know, and, and, and people respect that. And, and if they 
can prove that they do have more knowledge, well, then shoot, we'll, we'll go on up to middle school and uh, then high school and college. And so, you know, learning how to just talk to people, you know, that if you're getting into woodworking, if nothing else, especially if you're going to talk with customers, being able to explain to a customer very simply what your plan is makes all the difference in the world because a lot yep. of a lot of these people will go in well we're going to take this chamfer bit and we're going to uh take and put a 22 and a half degree a uh, chamfer along this edge and we're going to cut some rabbits and they start talking and using all this woodworking terms and people are people are just shaking their head like they know what you're talking about but inside you can see they're just empty yeah. so just, you yeah. know learn and talk to people and get comfortable with people and just let them know that you're you know you're not there to belittle them but just just chat yeah. with them that's, that's key to any part of life and see i it, in in all honesty the i would i am still sarcastic to this day i don't mean to be whatsoever but i talk down to people and i and i don't realize i'm doing it so i don't mean to be that good for <laughs> <laughs> yeah well not literally speaking oh. down to everybody but um it, it took me a while to learn that there is that balance because working in the retail store i just kind of hit it like i did the shop and it's not the shop you know when people come into the shop they they know their trade they may not know all the trades but you have those people that are always like oh yeah i know everything about this and they're they're trying to sell themselves in the shop setting and so in the store setting it's totally different. They're not trying to sell themselves. They're trying to figure out why this isn't working, what they need to do next. They've tried five or six different finishes and none of them are working out like they thought they would. Um, at a time there before YouTube really became a very good asset for woodworking knowledge, there was that YouTube Academy or YouTube um, University we used to joke with because those people that were on there weren't always 100% accurate with what they were doing they would hide how they actually got there and they're trying to make it more content based and and more uh, glamorous like cable television rather than the straight up truth of it so we we had to okay you know what did you know what did you find out and then you have to address it from there but i know i was always guilty of it now i've gotten a lot better and and i appreciate you on that i appreciate my wife 100 percent on that because she will call me out whenever it's like um you're not talking down sorry i apologize yeah oh yeah no i get busted for it because on the finishing side of it everyone wants to label me as an expert and i'll be the first to tell you that i'd be a guru i'm not an expert there's still so many more things out there to learn but i have made a ton of mistakes to where yeah don't do that that's that's what i could say to you i can just tell you that's not going to work or you're going to experience this if you do that and if it happens blah 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 mm -hmm. so i have learned that rope but what do you think um so that is your journey how you got to where you're at that has taken up all of our time tonight thank you so much for joining no, us oh no 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 <laughs> that's the reason why i kept a few of those stories back we gotta have stuff for later but michael Michael, yes. you started as a oh. wee young lad. What's your father's knees? <laughs> oh, that's so funny, John. Absolutely. I love it when, you know, kids, you know, you talk about 2000, they think it's like 2000 years ago. Uh, love it. But all right. So I don't ever like talking about myself because I have to say the things that I have experienced in life, the people that I have met people that I don't realize who they are today until today when, you know, my dad would tell me, he's like, you do realize who that was, right? No, I have no clue. So when I say that I treat everyone the same, as far as you put on your pants one leg at a time, um, I got started when my dad was very much a fine woodworking, a Norm Abrams. He would absorb as much as humanly possible. And he wanted to get into woodworking simply for the fact that he built speakers one time in high school. So when I was growing up, he took the two car garage and he converted that into a shop. He had the, but he got the antique type of, uh, he got the antique tools. Like I'm trying to remember how big that damn thing was, uh, maybe 16 inch planer, but the beds on it were like seven foot long beds and he hammer it, painted it green. I remember it because when he shut it off for dinner, it, we made a, it might've been 15 minutes later, that thing was still winding down. It would start to shake the house. Oh, so I grew up in a very, you know, it was, it was very open. I was actually skateboarding in the two car garage shop, going around all the tools while he wasn't in there kind of thing. But I got the grunt work. I was sweeping. I was doing the sanding. I remember coming home after school and he would be like, Hey, look, I need you to sand these real quick. Then you can go play. Um, 
just stuff like that's how it all started. And then high school, I'll never forget. I loved it. Our high school had a great uh, trades type of setting to it. So I got welding. I got metal fabrication, auto class, um, drafting and engineering. And then also we had an Intel class, which was really cool for that time because Intel in Arizona was that's where they were at. So it was real big. So I got all of these classes. Those were my electives. Everyone else is doing whatever they're doing for electives, but I got those. So I really enjoyed all of it. <clears throat> so then in high school, in order to see my dad, he's at this point, he's up to like 16 hours a day working. So I never saw him. So in the summertime, now this is Arizona, mind you. So I'm a genius of all things, but in the summertime, in order to see him, I had to go work for him. You know, that's how I got to spend time with him. So he had this shop and it had two other guys in it, Gerald, and Julio. Gerald was Native American, Navajo. Julio was straight up Brooklyn Spanish. They all had their different backgrounds in woodworking. So I got to learn a lot of different ways of going about it. Julio was 100% old school, classic trained. He was an apprentice. And when I say he was an apprentice, he basically was told what to do and never asked questions. So that's how he learned. The master would just tell him what to do. Gerald was more of that need to build maker type of, of spirit to him. So I got to learn um, how to cut on a table saw without a fence. And I also got to learn how, if you pack a cigarette enough times, it can totally Not recommended. Lean, yeah. It can totally lean out of your mouth while cutting on a table saw without a fence. So not the greatest in safety by all means, but there was definitely times where it was like you had to do it in order to get it done. So my first introduction into finishing, the reason I'm saying all this is because there was a, it was a thousand square foot shop in Arizona. There's absolutely no air conditioning in the shops. Well, they needed to lacquer something. Well, why don't you throw the kid out there and he'll do it. It's 110 degrees outside. So sure enough, um, I was doing these panels and I had never really sprayed too much before. I kind of finished some with my dad here and there, but not like this. And so they gave me the spray gun and I go and I spray it on there and I bring it back in and, and I just get, you know, just lashed at because it's like you need to overlap. You need to do this. You need to do that. So um, if you ever watch the Instagram, basically on my stories, I show how I spray, which is not normal because I had to learn to spray in 110 degrees. So with lacquer at 110, you got to be fast. You got to move in order to make sure it's smooth. And so that's how the finishing thing started. Then out of high school, started my own finishing business for these other cabinet shops that my dad worked with. So this whole time kind of working with him um, on the side. And the, the funny thing is, is that out of high school, I had two options. I could go to UTI and become a universal technical institute. I could become an auto mechanic. I think there was 15 spots for spot, uh, sponsorships that year. And I turned it all down so I could be in a band. Yes, that's exactly what I did. Um, but in the case of being in a band, what I did find out very quickly is that as a bass player, you need cabinets. So I was constantly building cabinets. My dad and I at nights, after he was done working, we'd get out the MDF and we'd start making these insane cabinets. And so that's how he got into everything he was doing with speakers. Um, that he still does to this day. So he got out of doing all the production work. He got out of doing all of his custom work and he got into doing speakers. But for years, we did a lot of different things, uh, kitchens and, and installs. And the downside is I don't have any pictures of any of it. I just didn't think to take pictures of it. It was back before pictures were available. I have rights is back before those cameras. Actually, I do remember a lot of times they had the cameras where you had to do the, uh, the disposable with the, yeah, that's a lot of our, so there's film somewhere. I do have a couple that are on regular film, but, uh, yeah, I don't have much, unfortunately. So what I do have is that in 2003, there was a place called revolution tea company and they wanted us to make these boxes. Originally we made these out of Paduke. So here you can see they're definitely not made out of Paduke. It looks like, um, oh my gosh, bamboo. My <laughs> bamboo. So uh, we built the original, I think it was first thousand of them. I helped finish them. That was my introduction to deft and why I never will use deft for a standard finish because it would not hold up to people grabbing and doing things with tea. So they took that whole production and they shipped it out overseas. So... Needless to say, as time went on, got married, moved to Hawaii, had to lose the shop, 
got divorced, moved to North Carolina, got married, got a shop. So now I finish furniture with my wife on the weekends. And um, that's pretty much the only time I have to do it because during the week, we're obviously working with Clint Ward's Woodworking Shop. Um, but a lot of stuff that I've done here is, is you know, I take the pictures of it and I show it after the fact. But a lot of times, if you want to see what I'm doing during the time frame, I do kind of grab a video or two here and there for the Instagram stories just to kind of give people an idea of what, what's going on. Because I ever since I met Izzy Swan, he was always telling me, dude, you got to show people what you're doing because it's not normal. Okay. So that's kind of how I got to where I am now. But yeah, you're, you're going to have to find some of the old footage of your uh, spray technique and we'll have to show that one on Wednesday. Yeah, no, I've got, well, I've got, if you go to the YouTube, I definitely have that chair video that I put out, how I tore all the chairs apart to stain the seats um, and how I spray them. And so you can kind of get an idea there, but yeah, no, I'll find some videos. It's fine. But I just, I don't know I, what uh, Gary Gare Bear Woodworks there. He always told me that it was like an artist touch to it. And I'm like, I just don't want any runs and I don't want overspray. So I don't know if it's an artist touch or not, but mm. that's how I'll look at it. So that's kind of my journey on it. Most of it's all due to my dad, 100%. And then opportunities came up and then different things changed over time. But I always came back to finishing. I think the craziest thing I ever finished was a 1989 Honda Civic hatchback. Went to Walmart. And I bought aluminum spray cans. They were a dollar piece. So they were metallic. They called them chrome, but it was just aluminum uh, flake. And I sprayed the entire car with aerosol cans. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just just to see if I could do it. It's one of those things where it's an 89 Honda. Who cares? Hmm. But that was a good car. Hmm. So we've got we've got horror stories for you. On future episodes, we've got some helpful things. Obviously, we're going to rely on the community to give us your questions because, yes, every day we do get questions and we do want to address them here and help answer it. But we'd also like for if you have any questions or anything that comes up in woodworking, we want to be able to help you with those things and don't want you to feel like, you know, if it's something you just want to contact the Facebook or YouTube page and then we'll address it anonymously. We can do that. No worries. But we really want you to come out and just ask the question and don't ever feel stupid about it. Because, like I said, I've spray painted a car silver. I've sprayed in 110 degree weather. There is no stupid questions. Yeah, well, maybe we should uh, start putting together our top five or ten list of biggest woodworking mistakes we've made and do a do an episode just on woodworking mistakes. And, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Can, can we count forklift mistakes? I don't know if it's related to woodworking. I mean, maybe you took the forklift and ran it into a pile of wood. I don't know. Well, I have this one here where I was loading a bargain box on the back of the truck for the extravaganza, and I high-centered the forklift. Mm. It's hard to see, I know, but that's easily. I found this picture, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I can never forget that. Had to get the electric pallet jack to lift up the back end in order to, like, wheelie it out. It's not as bad as our uh, general manager, and I won't name names. Uh, he was loading some something in a van and just crushed the whole back catch that was open one time. Nope. I still have to say that uh, riding a forklift, trying to pick up a 1642 jet lathe, not realizing that the little, um, there's a hood on them to make sure that pieces fly off. They don't hit you. I didn't realize it was down past the bed and the forks hit it and it completely flipped it over. There was nothing I could do. It was one of those moments where you're sitting there watching it happen and it's already, the wheels are already in motion and it's going to be a loud bang. It was. Well, at least you just damaged a machine. He damaged someone's car. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. A customer car. Anyway. So one thing we will talk about too, is that um, for many years, Clings Wars Woodworking Shop had the woodworking extravaganza and this isn't an advertisement. This is our life. Like this is our job. So these are things we get to talk about. Um, with that said, though, Hashtag not sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I think I, oh, I don't know if I did that or not. Yep, I did. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Couldn't forget my not sponsored thing. But um, the things that we saw, the things that happened, the things that we learned, everything that goes on with a woodworking show behind the scenes, we, we, we are going to have definitely, we had talked about this, we have an entire episode that can be dedicated to it because you yourself have been to IWFs. 
So you've been to the largest woodworking shows in the country, mm-hmm. all the way down to we have been to very small um, woodworking shops and clubs where we get to actually present. So we have seen the gamut of, of all of it. And so there's there's a lot of fun stories to it. Not only places to eat, though. Mm, I don't know. I always seem to find them. I did a show in Gainesville, Georgia. Back then they had the, uh, what was called the chicken fest every year. And they, uh, that happened to ha- happened to be the same weekend as the show we were on. And for $10, you got a wristband and all the locals and people from out of town came in and set up all these little tents. And if you had the wristband, you could go and eat as many wings at as many of those places as you want, give you a ticket. And after you're done making your laps, you drop the ticket in the favorite uh, wing place. Oh, if that you've never like experienced five pounds of wings, it sounds good, but man, it does not sit well when you still have to work the rest of the day at a trade show. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to learn to eat light, drink light. But it's the buffet mentality. I paid for this buffet. I'm going to get my money's worth. Well, you know, so. Yeah, you anyway, get so much. You, you have a lot of fun and you, you learn to find the cool spots and talk to the right people yeah. and, um, you know, but yeah, no, so we, we've got to, a, we've got a lot of experience both with woodworking and travel and talking with industrial customers. And mm-hmm. so we, we're just hoping to share just some of that knowledge and get to know you a little bit more, but we wanted yeah. to start this off by kind of letting you get to know us just so you wouldn't think there's this, these two yahoos trying to start a podcast that, you know, say they know woodworking. And, Out of all the know, yahoos that are trying to start a podcast, why these two? Yeah. We actually have been wanting to do this for over a year now, but certain things happen. So we're getting started now. Yeah. Best way but, to look at it. Yeah. Hopefully you'll join us uh, on future nights and we'll uh, kind of uncover some things and we'll hopefully find some topics that uh, interest you. And, um, you know, I know we've talked about a few things like uh, how to set up a shop and what what tools you you got to have, what tools aren't quite as important, uh, what tools you definitely don't want to skimp on quality. So, you know, just a lot of topics we've got on our minds that, you know, we get a lot of questions on in our day jobs that we answer all the time. But we thought we'd kind of make this a little more informal and a little less um, corporate. Yeah, and that's just, a good way just, to put it. Just share, you know, because uh, that's what we like to do. We like to just share our passion for woodworking. Thank you, so. Kyle. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, he, he was here the whole time. Yeah, he was here the wow. whole time. That poor guy. Must I know. Be, must be bored. Uh, by the way, uh, not sponsored, but if if you are looking to learn CNC more specifically, the Vectrix software, go check that guy out. Learn your CNC.com. I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of different instructors and I would, I would put him pretty high on that list uh, as far as how he's got this program presented out. But anyway, just uh, chopping it a little mention for that guy. Cause he's, he's a cool cat and does, does very good with it. Yep. Learn your CNC.com. And, uh, and I still complain to him that it's way too cheap for what he's offering. Yeah. Like you can go from not knowing anything about CNC Vet, was it Vetrix software aspire mm-hmm. yeah all the way up to you know per, i would say you're going to get a heck of an education out of it a lot cheaper than you would at a university or any other school and, and, the, and the, way, is, the way he's formatted it is is key nobody else has formatted it the way he's done it and it just makes it so simple and easy to learn hope he has a patent on that because that could be rough mm. he might now <laughs> <laughs> He's Googling it right now. Like, oh, crap. Well, I'll say, what do you say? He had the sound off the whole time. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Can't say as I blame him. Oh, right. It's a good thing it's a podcast on mute. Yeah, I was uh, trying to oh. learn to read lips. Sadly, I failed. <laughs> yeah, tonight well, wasn't the right night for that. Yeah, I guess not. But no, hey, that's who we are in a, in a brief nutshell, you know, an hour long brief nutshell. But uh, hopefully you'll uncover a little more about us. Uh, some things I hope you like, uh, maybe some things you don't like. But hey, that's what woodworking is all about. We all have we are what we are. Cut. Yeah, that's right. Like, we are what we are. At this point, like I tell my wife, I'm, I'm too old to be trained by another woman. So she's stuck with me. Well, mm-hmm. in my woodworking mindset, 
I always try to learn new things, but there's a lot of things I'm just setting my ways on. So as long as you're setting your ways, nothing wrong with it, but try to maybe just tweak it a little every day. Yep. My, my, my favorite thing in the entire world, and I know this is weird, but when I was in high school doing the woodworking thing, you know, in the summers, I would come home and I'd make chocolate chip cookies and it's the toll house recipe. And my wife made some today and I still know that recipe by heart. But every time I'd make it, I always think like, could I add something else? Could I do this? Could I do that? And there's a few times where you tweak it and it does not go well. Mm. And then there's other times where you tweak it and it does do well. And then tonight I was thinking about, I was like, why did I tweak it? Why did I experiment with anything? If Toll House is telling me this is how it's made, then this is, should be how it's made. But then I was like, but that's like woodworking. Yeah. Yes, you can do it this way. Nothing wrong with you. If you wanted to, you know, tweak it a little bit, add your own touch to it. That's what makes it your woodworking experience. Yeah, we, we can all build a box. The question is, are you going to use a butt joint, a miter joint, finger joint, dovetail? You can do a lot of things to make a simple box be I transformed. Got, now that you say that, it's funny because I got called out on IG for using pocket screws. <laughs> I was like, but they're like little mini clamps. Hmm. That's how I think of them. I use them for everything because of the fact that if I am going to use them, that washer head is going to clamp down whatever I'm putting on there. A little CA glue, a little pocket screw, not even in a pocket. I don't even use pockets. I just put it in as a screw. But see, that's my touch. That's that's the way that I do it. So it doesn't mean it's wrong. doesn't mean it's right. But yeah, I got called out for being like, I don't remember how you put it. It was like Mr. Money Bags or something like that. And I thought, they're pocket screws. They're not that expensive. Uh, what, one day I'll show you how I have some of my sheetrock mounted because the ceiling in this thing was sagging pretty bad when I got it. I remember. Uh, and I had to use a, uh, literally I had to use a three inch screw wow. to suck the sheetrock back up. And I, I've got a, probably an inch and a quarter washer on a standard sheetrock screw. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it sucked that drywall right up. I'll tell you what. Now we're not going to say that a lot of the things that we show or talk about are not redneck approved. They are engineered by ingenuity. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that's, that's what makes it you and your shop and having a good time doing it is that if it works and it doesn't break in six months, eh, you're good to go. You know, I guess we could create controversy right here on our first episode. What's that? Round over or chamfer? Oh yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's get started with a bang. <laughs> yeah. Actually, why don't we do that for the next one? We'll just talk about profile CNC router bits the whole thing but uh i am 100 percent team chamfer mm. i'm about 80 20 round over chamfer yeah, yeah no i don't mind taking a chamfer and doing a little knock on the edges with sandpaper but turn a chamfer into a round over no no it's not turning into a round over it's more of like an eased chamfer oh, oh so it's not a crisp edge anymore it's more of a radius <laughs> Yeah, this can go on for hours, just so you know. We do this all the time at work, but it's definitely team chamfer or team roundover. Which one are you guys? Yeah, we're just coming. waiting on the weirdo coming through here. So, no, I'm team OG. Well, you that's, the, team that's the guy we'll ban from the show. <laughs> yeah. You be team OG. That's fine. That doesn't answer the question, though. Right. Are you regular OG or Roman OG? Oh, I like the guys. Like, I'm a shaker door kind of guy. Mm. So tongue and groove, got it. Or as the redneck would say, I want an oogie bit. Oh, <laughs> that's funny you say that. First time that ever came up is almost like calling a grocery bag a poke. I know I look like a deer in headlights. I was like, do what? Yep. I don't want them romaine oogies. It's not <laughs> lettuce, buddy. Nice part is you're not making fun. That's exactly how they asked for it. Oh, hey, I'm I'm redneck. I tried to clean it up a little bit just for this thing, but hey, <laughs> just every now and then you let the redneck slip out and it's over. Actually, when Chris gets really mad, sometimes it'll slip out and it's really funny, but you can't laugh and show him you're laughing because <laughs> it just makes him more mad. Oh, look at the little guy getting angry. Oh, yeah, oh that's so funny. Yeah. Oh, never said that, but I always get told I look like that. Uh, Telling you look. that you're the little guy getting angry. Yeah, anyways. All yeah. right, so on that note, I'm happy. I hope you guys all enjoyed this. I hope it was somewhat beneficial. Here's the first episode and who we are. 
Oh, help you for 55 yeah. minutes of enjoying this. Well, if, if you watched it and you think there might be some potential here, come back next week and maybe invite your friends. And, yeah, you know, who knows? Good. I mean, there's only two of us here. We could eventually turn this into a rotating third wheel. There you invite go. on people. Yeah. And we, we, we don't want to be stuck in a box with this. We want this to be kind of open to interpretation and be flexible with the format and uh, make it more informal. So it's more for you. Thank you for watching John and listening and all your comments on Instagram. Uh, was yeah. He listening no. uh, with the sound off too. Yeah. Yeah. He was making sure that the sound was off early on. Let's see where he was at. Oh, see, yeah. He didn't have sound because he was back in the 1900s. Gotcha. Gotcha. But, um, yeah, no, there is definitely an open door for thirds and fours having guests on. Absolutely. This is, we're just going to have fun with it, you know, and yep. do what we can. We've, we've spent a lot of time listening to our podcasts that we enjoy. Nothing wrong with the format that they have it at. We just talk about it and we just said, you know what? Let's just make it more open, more flexible. So Wednesdays at nine o'clock. And I guess you could say, as the song says, we did it my way. I wish you hadn't ended on song. <laughs> well, I thought you'd pick up and start the dance. So we'd end on a song and a dance. No, nah, no one wants yeah. to see a chubby guy in a chair dance. No. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll tell you what. Go ahead and walk us on out. Oh, quality entertainment. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Mike Z. I'm Chris. We'll see you next time. Have a good night.